Great, thank you, John. Um, so I guess there's a couple of two things. So I want to provide an update on the process that we've undergone, including you, John, and others, uh, a few of you on the phone, including Amina and others around the federal interagency group um, to revise the principles for the conducting research in the Arctic. And then um, I'd like to leave time just to have some responses, comments, discussion about uh, sort of where we are now uh, and remind everyone that um, the revised draft principles are out for public review right now. So um, there are some slides. I'm gonna go ahead and I think share my screen and use the slide deck that is available on uh, the IARPIC Collaborations website. I can find them, there they are. Can everyone see? First slide with the title, Principles for Conducting Research. Yeah, I can see them here. Okay, good. All right, so um, this process began a while back um, and primarily was meant to um, look at these principles that were originally put forward back in 1990. Um, adopted by IARPIC, the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee, uh, having been prepared by an uh, interagency social science task force at the time, which had been recommended, if I remember correctly, by the Polar Research Board. And sort of the overarching goal of these principles were to address the need to promote, as you can read, mutual respect and communication between Arctic residents and scientists. And so, again, this was done in uh, 90s. Uh, or done at the end of the 80s and, and finally sort of adopted in 1990, uh, which is now some time ago. We're going almost 30 years hence. Um, there have been a lot of advances and changes in theoretical and empirical approaches for conducting research in the Arctic. There have been uh, just been better respect and acknowledgement for the role of indigenous knowledge, uh, improving, improving engagement with Alaska Native and other Arctic indigenous communities. And the current Secretariat IARPIC uh, leadership felt uh, it was time to, to take a look back at these principles, um, review them, evaluate, see what is still appropriate and applicable, um, help to perhaps define or, or identify some new areas or new, new guidelines, as well as also um, make them a little bit more succinct. So if, if any of you have looked at the Arabic principles in the past, I think there's 13 or 14 different ones um, that get into quite a bit of detail about particular areas of natural, physical, and social sciences. Um, there's not really too much on, on health sciences necessarily, although there is some uh, language about human subjects research. Um, we wanted to make it even more simple and approachable, accessible, so that um, you know, much wider adoptability potential. That's a little bit of the history. Um, we had some specific goals at the start of our process, again, to revise uh, and ideally strengthen the principles. And by strengthen, again, really trying to make sure that they are adopted or put into practice to the best of the abilities of researchers, uh, as well, both academic researchers and community researchers and uh, agency researchers or agencies that help to support research in the Arctic. Um, one of the things that we also wanted to, to really strive for was um, ensuring broad participation in this review process, evaluation process. And so uh, there were many different approaches that we took with regards to uh, public engagement. Um, I remember leading off something at the Alaska Health Summit uh, last January, um, getting initial comments comments from the listening sessions. Uh, other members of our working group did similar um, listening sessions at our events. There was an initial federal register notice. Just sort of an open-ended um, question or, or, or request to you know, take a look at what's, what's out there right now and provide some comment and feedback ways to you know, what still seems to work, what it's appropriate, um, and in some ways how, how we can better ensure that these principles are, are put into practice. Um, and of course, certainly once we complete our, our task, uh, the idea is to ensure as wide dissemination as possible and, and try to put them into practice. And I know there have been some questions along the way and challenges about you know, how can these be enforced or how, how do we sort of, um, I say not police them, but just make sure that, that these principles are, are in fact enacted. Um, and that's something that we're still gaining feedback um, and. If Renee were, were here, she'd say that you know these are supposed to be guiding principles, not to really supersede other existing um, 
rules of conduct, for example, from your host institutions or the communities in which you work or other professional organizations in which you participate, but really uh, sort of be a supplementary document to the existing literature that's out there, including some that have been produced by indigenous organizations. So uh, the, the revisions working group include the following individuals, uh, co-led by Renee Crane and myself. Some of you are aware, or others may not be aware, that I recently moved from the National Institutes of Health. So I've joined the Office of Polar Programs, the National Science Foundation, as a new program director. Um, so my affiliation is now with NSF. Um, and uh, we had, as you can see, wide uh, participation from IARPIC agencies, uh, folks based up in Alaska, as well as here in, in Washington, in Washington. Uh, in subgroups. Uh, we had a, an outreach team, which included John and Cheryl Rosa, uh, and Candace Nachman, um, as well as a drafting team that, that took up the, the bulk of the work of taking into account, considering the, 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 the many different comments and input that we receive across the different mode, uh, the different media uh, from which we solicited comments. Um, and that included myself and Renee, Cynthia McColliver from EPA, as well as Amina Shartup. Um, who did a great job there. So um, that was our group. Um, and as we went through the process, we had uh, several overarching questions uh, with respect to, to our, our process. These included uh, items like what elements of the principles should be preserved. Because if you take a careful read, I think there are still some, some of the, the original principles um, did a, a decent job of standing the test of time. And so we wanted to make sure that we were able to capture some of those. And it was especially valuable to hear from researchers and community members uh, about ways in which some of those principles had been uh, put into play and worked well, and in other cases, uh, perhaps not as well. And so that was also important to, to, to take into account. Um, we also, to a certain extent, uh, wanted to sort of prior, I want to say to the extent so within reason, prioritize things that really were most key or critical to conducting successful research across the Arctic. Um, and if you were to look at the, the, the previous or the existing principles, you'll probably know that you know, several uh, of them are overlapping or could be subsumed under a general category. And that's, again, what was one of our, our key questions driving this, this process. Um, next, we also thought about you know, um, again, room for improvement. There's always things that can improve. Uh, we have, there are, you know, countless stories of, of successes and a few stories of, of less than successful engagement and interactions between communities and researchers. Of course, that varies from different disciplines uh, across, uh, across uh, the science, the research community. Um, but there are probably still some universal approaches and, and strategies that all research, regardless of their specific questions um, can can take as an approach in working uh, in the Arctic um, and of course uh, as I mentioned earlier uh, you know we don't want to have a wasted effort and really now we're close to that point where we are getting the final round of input and comments on the revised draft and once we receive those are able to address and respond to those comments we'll will we'll complete a final final draft that will eventually be off reviewed by the IRB agencies um, and put into practice as 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 best as possible. So ensuring the wide dissemination of those principles um, will you know will be our, our final goal slash question or, or answer to a question that we've been uh, engaged in over the past uh, year plus. Um, I'll just quickly give a recap of the process. Um, I mentioned a little bit of this earlier without the specifics, but we included, uh, as I mentioned, listening sessions and outreach to gather input and comments. Uh, like I said, I think I kicked this off with the Alaska Native Health Research Conference back in Anchorage last year, uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs Providers Conference, um, a federal register notice to request comments. Um, we had direct uh, interactions and communications with different uh, we did basically targeted interviews, uh, members of communities and researchers and including indigenous organizations. Uh, I mean, it also did a great literature review, just uh, you know, thinking of what's happening in, um, 
in the field, but looking at what different publications have, have been produced over you know, the past couple of decades, what are really relevant to, um, to, to our, our goals here, and um, working together with uh, the broader principles revision working group. Uh, we you know, revised the document, um, I was involved in helping sort of establish, once we had all these comments, breaking down sort of this, this, um, this iterative process of, we had all these comments, and actually it was very similar to something I had done for um, the Rising Sun Initiative that I led under the Arctic Council's chairmanship, where we were consolidating these different comments and, and, and combining them and making sure that there wasn't duplication and, and needless overlap. And so we were able to, to boil down to maybe 13 or 14 fundamental ideas or, or concepts, which were further distilled to really Really four uh, broad principles. Um, we uh, the current uh, federal register notice is open uh, until September fourth, so that's where we have circulate for public comment. Um, so if you haven't already taken a look, uh, I really encourage everyone to to look at those, look at that document, and provide their input. Um, and once the the federal register notice period closes, uh, our working group will come back and. Um, look at those comments, review them, address them to the best of our abilities, and revise uh, the principles document, and then submit them for, for final approval for, for, to the Arctic agencies. Um, and then, of course, we'll begin with that, that, that broader dissemination process. Um, let me just go back for a second. I think we forgot one thing that's not listed on, on this, this slide. Um, also, together with, with John's help uh, and the Alaska Team Media Institute, uh, we created a small video that's also on, our, on, our, on the IARPIC website, and I'll, and I'll show it in a few moments, just a few minutes long, uh, which is another way of promoting uh, this process and encouraging people to, to reach out, to look at these principles, again, those who are interested in or work in the sector, to um, to again provide input on 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 their their thoughts. Um, so this uh, third to last slide or so uh, just gives us a reminder of the timeline. Um, June 2017, so last summer is when we started, uh, and the staff group of IARPIC was uh, uh, allowed us to proceed. We took a part of the summer to organize, to working group, develop a strategy, and initially we met on a fairly frequent basis every two weeks just to get really organized, essentially, uh, and map out the different processes, uh, which included you know, working with stakeholders here, revise, uh, developing a revised draft that was sent out to the federal regionist, um, and then uh, you know, moving forward with, with uh, those final stages. Um, so in a nutshell, Oh, is there someone a question or a comment? Hey, it's John Pierce. Do you mind if I ask a question real quick on that? Oh, go ahead, John. Yeah, the previous so slide. After the after the final approval, um, do we know where the the principles will reside for folks to, to sort of access and disseminate from from there? So for sure, we're going to put it on the Arabic Collaborations website. Uh, there was some talk of adding it uh, to the research plan, sort of as an addendum. Um, but I suspect we also will do a, a, a campaign to make sure that all the IARPIC agencies and all the funding agencies will also uh, have that available to, to the, their investigators and, and okay, the program thanks. officials. So yeah, I, th I think we haven't finalized that yet, but that is at least part of the thinking at this point. All right, so um, from the many comments that we received and the dozen or so kind of uh, fundamental ideas, we eventually distilled this down to five core principles, uh, which are listed on the slide here, be accountable, establish effective communication, respecting local culture and knowledge, build and sustain relationships, pursue responsible environmental stewardship. And this is just, again, the, the, the overarching core principles, but if you look at the actual draft revision, each of these different core principles has uh, several bulleted items underneath which explain a little bit more about the context of why it's important to, to have these principles, some examples of how to actually put them into practice, and gives, uh, much, it gives further guidance on, on ways in which these core principles can be put into practice. Um, so I think uh, 
these were, you know, these really came about uh, from the many different discussions that we had in the working groups, the outreach we, we conducted with a broad range of stakeholders, also was consistent with a lot of the, the existing literature out there, uh, both from academics and indigenous organizations and other, other stakeholders. And so um, we feel that we, we, we've, captured, we've captured these, these core principles um, in, in, a, in, a, in a good way. Way. To future actions moving forward, um, again, you know, these principles are to you know, base are, are primarily targeted at the IRPIC agencies um, and, and the researchers. Again, everyone conducting research in the Arctic, but I think are also applicable to other organizations out there um, who are who are invested in Arctic research. Um, here, there is mention of including the principles in future publications of the five-year plan. Um, and I think also uh, once we have the, the final approved versions, we'll return in probably the next year. So uh, a lot of the collaboration teams are beginning to their, their reporting, their annual reporting, which are due at the end of next month. Um, in early 2019, there'll be uh, presumably the meeting to uh, establish uh, the next annual plan. I think including these principles uh, and discussing these principles and how and how best to adopt them across the different collaboration teams and the research that is supported or, or um, uh, con conducted by, by collaboration team members will be part of, of that process for, for the next year. Um, we actually actually also uh, submitted the principles document as a deliverable for the upcoming Arctic Science Ministerial in Berlin uh, at the end of October. Um, so we're going to be a little bit tight, I think, in terms of the timeline, but um, I think we, we've heard the assurances that even if it's the, the final, final, final document isn't approved by this date, that we should be okay. Um, and I think it's really uh, important that different program officials, program directors, managers, researchers, um, other leaders in the field uh, continue to communicate about implementation um, and use of these principles, uh, particularly with Alaska Native and, and other Arctic indigenous communities, uh, as well as their representatives. Um, and although this was primarily a national or domestic uh, task, again, through our interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee, um, we are also, I think, beginning that outreach to some of the international groups, including Arctic Council Working Groups and other, some of the permanent participants or indigenous peoples organizations that are involved with, with the Arctic uh, Council. And so uh, we really want this to be as broadly, widely disseminated as possible. Um, and then of course, you know, our job is not completely done um, other than, you know, setting the stage for um, allowing the opportunity not to wait another almost 30 years, but uh, I think it makes sense in line with the, um, the five-year plan uh, during that next step that there will be opportunities to potentially review again um, and, and modify as needed. I'm sure there will be new, new challenges, new, new innovation, new innovation or technologies, uh, and other approaches that will may um, influence uh, the way some of these principles are, are carried out. So um, that's all I have to share for for this time frame. Um, and uh, you know, for additional information, uh, can I just reach out to Renee or, or myself? Um, this will need to be corrected. But um, if you look me up within the IRP Collaborations website. I've updated my profile. My new email address is uh, robdlga at nsf.gov. So you took the first three letters of my first name, the first five letters of my last name, put that together at nsf.gov, as opposed to something simple like R Delgado. That wasn't up to me. Anyway, there's also the IARPIC principles alias email at nsf.gov that you can provide comments to. Or, um, um, yeah, um, so. I'll hold off onto questions. I want to just briefly go through the video. It's just a few minutes long. Oh, wait, whoops, that's, no, that's the wrong video. Sorry. <laughs> that was the webinar. Okay, here's the video. But Jessica, is it best if I just play it through here? Depending on how you're connected to my screen? sound, um, I'm not sure if it'll work, but go ahead and give it a try. Uh, all right. And. Uh, Let me stop it right there. Can people hear that all right? Or no, we're not hearing the sound. Okay, so uh, sometimes when you're playing a video, it... okay, that's all right. So it's a short video. Oh. Encourage. We, no, why? You know, it's because you're wearing your headphones. <laughs> if I pull it off. Yeah, that might work. Okay. Yeah, that might work. All of a sudden, 
Federal agencies that support scientific research in the Arctic can coordinate, share ideas and good practices, and co-support projects. Could people hear the, the audio then? Yes, now we can hear it. Okay, I'll let it play there. IARPIC adopted the principles for the conduct of research in the Arctic to provide clarity to researchers work in the Arctic on expectations for their behavior and conduct of research while in the Arctic. Since 1990, when the original principles were released, the Arctic has undergone changes and so has the way in which researchers work with communities. The revised principles document captures the most important elements of working in the Arctic, accountability, respect, communication, building relationships, and stewardship of the environment. In Kotzebue, we spent the first year of our project working with our advisory council to design our hypotheses before starting any other research activities. And this project is still ongoing and we remain closely engaged with the community as we collect and interpret our data. The other thing about that is to acknowledge that Indigenous peoples have always been researchers, um, not necessarily in the ways that Western academia and Western ways have um, defined research, you know, we, we've always been really good observers. We've always been um, experimenting and understanding with our land and our environment. So we're researchers in our own right too. There are a diversity of opinions and thoughts about the value of the research we do. You know, we're always looking for ways to better engage with to the communities as their knowledge is highly relevant to our research. Even as an insider, as an indigenous and local person, sometimes there's definitions are. But always being an authentic, real person first, being a new back first, being a mother first, and sharing very openly what the intentions are and why I'm collaborating is really beneficial. And I believe in research serving our people in our communities. Most of our research centers on how wildlife is responding to the changing environmental conditions and folks that live in these communities, the communities that we base out of, are experiencing many of those changes. Additionally, some of the species that we study are culturally and nutritionally important to these communities, so there's a mutual desire to ensure the long-term persistence of those species. The revised principles for conducting research in the Arctic is now available for public comment. Comments on the revised principles will help ensure the final version includes diverse perspectives and covers the broad range of research conducted in the Arctic. The principles should serve as a guide for working in the Arctic and are a reminder of what is most fundamentally important when planning and conducting research in the Arctic. Thank you. For For participating in the IARPIC principles for conducting research in the Arctic. Your comments will make this document better. Great. So, um, burning question uh, or comments and thoughts at this time? Happy to, to answer that. I know we got started a little bit late, so we're probably a little bit behind schedule. Um, I'll leave it to you guys. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just let everybody know that I'm going to share the link to this uh, principles page where you can find this video and all the information for submitting your comments. Um, I'm going to share that link in the chat right now. Well, thanks a lot, Roberta. This is John. Um, and if any, if anyone wants to send these on to folks that may not have heard about this yet um, or haven't seen the video that's been recently completed. We'd appreciate it and forward that on to other people. Presented this to a number of different people and got some initial feedback and um, some requests for a bit more time for them to think about it to get back to us. So we're looking forward to hearing those comments. Um, and if folks are going to be traveling anywhere and doing meetings with other people, this is something else you might add or think about adding to those meetings to let people know about because the, the more comments we get, the better better this will be in the broader, more broad perspective we can, we can incorporate and think about as we develop this. Um, so yeah, any other ideas or comments or questions on that? Okay, well, um, why don't we move to the next item on the agenda and Carolina Behe, um, I asked her if she could give us a, a summary of um, the ICC summit meeting that happened in Utkiagovic, what was that now, three weeks ago, Carolina, or longer? Yeah, about three weeks ago. Okay.
So mm -hmm. she has a presentation that will talk about some of the um, the discussions that took place there. And I think Jessica, do you have that ready? Uh, I can do the sharing. Okay, that'd be great. Okay, uh, so well, Koyana to um, John uh, for inviting us to share information about the recently concluded General Assembly and to all of you who have called in to learn and engage in the discussion. Uh, so for those of you that are not familiar, the Inuit Circumpolar Council was founded in 1977 by Evan Hobson Sr., who's from Utgavik, uh, with the vision to bring Inuit together to address common concerns with a common voice. Today, ICC advocates on behalf of approximately 165,000 um, Inuit across Chukotka, Alaska, Canada, and Greenland. The, the unique role that ICC plays is, is largely based that it holds consultative two status at the United Nations at all of the UN um, bodies and agencies, and is also a permanent participant at the Arctic Council. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what that means in, in a bit. So ICC holds a general assembly every four years at, at which uh, Inuit delegates from across the circumpolar region elect a new chair and an executive council. They develop policies and adopt, adopt resolutions that will guide the activities of our organization for the coming next coming four years. The General Assembly is really the heart of our organization and provides an opportunity for sharing information, discussing common concerns, debating issues, and strengthening the bonds between all Inuit. So in July, we held the 13th Inuit Circumpolar Council General Assembly. There were over 900 people registered to attend the General Assembly and brought together Inuit from across Chukotka, Alaska, Canada, and Greenland. Of the hundreds of people in attendance were also 64 Inuit delegates who approved and adopted the Utgavik Declaration. So each country has its own process for nominating who those delegates are. But to give you an example, um, within Alaska, uh, we have a 13-member board um, that is primarily made up of our regional uh, for-profit and non-profit organizations. And those organizations elect who who the delegates are, um, the, the delegates for Alaska are. Also at the General Assembly, um, our new international chair was elected, and we're really excited to share that Dr. Daly Sambo Duro is, our now, is now our international chair. Dr. Uh, Sambo Duro is from Unicleet, Alaska, and so our office here in Alaska will be hosting the chairmanship for the next four years. So the declaration is, uh, again, what will guide our work for the next four years. Um, and and I, I think that I've probably shared with many of you before that if you look back at all of the other declarations, there's common themes that are seen in every single one from the very beginning. So for example, uh, you will not miss food security here. It's always going to be there, right, um, and other similar, uh, similar points. In this declaration, it contains 10 sections and 58 different clauses. Within these sections, some of the key focus areas are on contaminants. Well, sorry, first I should tell you, here's the 10 sections. Um, and in, again, in those sections, you'll, you'll see key focus on things such as contaminants, climate change, biodiversity. Um, Roberto, you'd be interested to know that suicide plays a really prominent role. Uh, we're addressing suicide and intergenerational trauma. Also in indigenous knowledge, the circumpolar management. Uh, there's also a focus on advocating for the utilization and ethical and meaningful engagement of indigenous knowledge. It calls a lot for bringing together the science and indigenous knowledge and calls to advance community-driven research. As we have in the past, we will all will engage in these topics through indigenous knowledge, science, and policy at the national and international level. So across the sections, there is a focus, a large focus on international work. Uh, mo most of our work is within international forums, and this slide just provides you a snapshot uh, of the scope of our work at what some of these forums are. 
The declaration calls for further engagement in numerous UN bodies, such as the Convention on Biological Diversity, the United Nations Environmental Program, the World Health Organization, the UN Framework on Convention on Climate Change. In addition to working within these bodies and others listed in the declaration, there is a specific need to ensure that the UN bodies are implementing the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So we really need to um, look and see if um, the UN is actually using its own policies and practices that have been adopted. This is really where we get to a lot of that meaningful and ethical engagement part also. The declaration also calls for continued and further focus within the Arctic Council work. And so those that might not be so familiar, uh, this is the structure of the Arctic Council. The Arctic Council is made up of eight Arctic states and six permanent participants. The permanent participants represent the indigenous peoples of the Arctic. Um, the Inuit Circumpolar Council is one of those permanent participants. Uh, we're a very active member in all the working groups, engaged in many of the projects, sit at the table with the senior Arctic officials and the ministers. So as mentioned before, the declaration calls for a continued and enhanced engagement within the Arctic Council. ICC's interest in the Arctic Council and the UN is not just at an international level or because of an international level. It is meant to address all of the community concerns using that, that avenue. Um, but it's recognized that work needs to be implemented domestically. So not through a top-down approach, but through an approach that is up from a community to regional to national scale to feed internet into international work and then implement it nationally as well as internationally. So we really need to see that within, uh, within the work that's done within the UN and um, the Arctic Council. Uh, there has to be this continuous flow ac across those different scales. So looking at the overarching sections, there are a few actions or, or many that may have be of interest to the people on the call today. Uh, so we thought maybe it would be helpful just to highlight a couple of those. So under Indigenous Knowledge, ICC is being directed to continue to educate on what Inuit knowledge or Indigenous knowledge is and to work to make political and intellectual space for Inuit indigenous knowledge This is something we're currently doing in many ways, and one of them is in working with IARPIC um, and encouraging IARPIC to continuously um, expand uh, platforms that is conducive for indigenous knowledge holders to engage in the discussions, provide their own presentations, and, and things like that. Another directive is for ICC to facilitate and develop international Inuit protocols on the equitable and ethical utilization of indigenous knowledge and engagement of Inuit communities to provide guidance to international forests, such as Arctic Council. Um, this, is, this will be a really large undertaking and, and something that we have heard from as a need from Inuit communities across the scales for many years now. And so we, we hope to achieve that under, under these next four years, actually within the next couple of years. So for those of you familiar with our food security work, you'll be familiar with our understanding that all of these components are interconnected. So while we have section style of food security, this is directly connected to components about biodiversity, language, contaminants, and all the other pieces that you'll find within the declaration. One of the directives under food security is to explore ways to enhance networking capabilities, to enhance the exchange of information and practices. It seems that this is something that we are all striving to do. It, it's one of the key aspects of IARPIC. Enhancing the networking capabilities across Inuit organizations will increase the exchange of both indigenous knowledge and science across geographic and temporal scales but it may also aid in addressing um, issues surrounding information sovereignty and accessibility. Uh, there are many directives under this, under this uh, theme. Uh, one of them has to do with supporting a circumpolar wildlife committee. This is a newly formed committee that was formed out of um, a, a wildlife management summit that ICC hosted late last year. our Kitty Carlet Declaration, the last one we were working under. 
this really has to do with recognizing the need for circumpolar management, um, recognizing that animals are not bound by boundaries, uh, and that Inuit aren't either, right? It's one culture across those four countries, uh, but that we really need to move beyond um, just these uh, these agreements to more active management that looks at the entire piece of the puzzle, the entire Arctic. Uh, this is something that Inuit are doing, at, you know, regardless of what formal governments are doing, uh, but we want to see that enhanced even more and, and institutionalized even within the government. So under environment, one action is focused on sharing research and actions that build climate resilience and to share and showcase the adaptation and innovative mitigation responses, including uh, monitoring the movement of animals due to climate change, erosion, community relocation, that are all being designed and implemented by our communities. Um, so our, our communities actually have are doing a lot of things that, that maybe aren't being shared um, internationally or even nationally. And so this really calls for us to make that more obvious so that it can become more actively supported. It's also a huge focus on plastic and microplastics and to advocate for the implementation and effective monitoring of regimes within international agreements, such as the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants. And there's an important directive uh, for ICC to advocate for Inuit-led environmental monitoring and management across Inuit Nunat. Uh, Nunat means homeland, for, for those that aren't familiar. Under sustainable development, ICC is directed to support responsible mining policies that reflect the 2011 ICC Declaration on Resource Development and Principles in Inuit Nunat. Uh, ICC is urged to compile Arctic tourism best practices and develop an ICC statement on tourism to help guide tourism activities. We're also encouraged to utilize indigenous knowledge to advise all future processes of the Central Arctic Ocean Moratorium on commercial fishing. There's a lot of directives under this. I potential for mapping and other visual aids related to Inuit sea ice and coastal sea use and multiple dimensions of such use uh, as Arctic homeland. ICC is directed to advocate for the rights of fresh water. ICC is asked to advance within the Arctic Council an agenda to address a crisis of public infrastructure, which includes energy, roads, housing, sewer, water. So there's a lot of work that has already begun or is continuing on that addresses much of the declaration. And, and again, this just gives a, a bit of a snapshot of what some of those action items and directions are. Um, but we would encourage any of you that are interested to actually read the declaration. And if there's points that you're particularly interested in, we definitely could have a, a further conversation about it. But our next steps will include the development of a strategy and implementation plan um, that is circumpolar wide. So, but also, uh, although the Inuit Circumpolar Council is one organization, we still have our individual offices. Um, so, to give you an idea, here in Alaska, ICC advocates on behalf of uh, 95 tribal councils that are spread across 81 villages within these four regions. Uh, so. In addition to developing that international strategy and implementation plan, um, within Alaska, we'll also develop a, a strategy plan that is specific to the needs of communities here in Alaska. It'll be very much related to the international uh, strategy and the, the overall Utqiagvik Declaration, but, but uh, we'll put the focus of the um, technical staff from our office on the direct needs of the communities here. So with that, if uh, again, uh, if you would like more information, please take a look at our at our website or feel free to contact me at the Utkavik Declaration, the Arabic site, but my 
internet's very slow. <laughs> um, but I don't know, going back, if there's any questions. Carolina, thanks so much for that summary. This is John again. Um, one question I had was, uh, you mentioned the declaration sort of establishes um, maybe the priorities over the next four years that ICC and, and all the different groups that are part of that will focus on. Um, mm -hmm. Are there are there updates over the next four years that people might be able to refer to to see sort of what new you know new uh, uh, accomplishments there are or new activities there are under some of those different topics? I think there's a number of those there that are interested to people on the phone call and elsewhere. So I'm just wondering if you can direct people to maybe updates or reports that come out over the next four years. Yeah, they're always they're always accessed through our website. And we also we also try to keep a an email list of people that are interested in receiving those type of updates um, to, to send that information to them. Uh, so so if it is something that you are interested in, please please uh, contact us and let us know. Um, give us your contact information. We would be really happy to share that information with you. Um, and then and then we we send out press releases too. I okay. don't get a lot of press uh, uptake in Alaska, to be honest. But Canada, the Canadian press picks it up quite a bit. So a lot of it just goes out through email and um, social media, and then platforms like this. Anyone else have any questions? I have one more, but I'll wait to see if anyone else has something. Well, Carolina, I'll just ask one more, um, and that relates to indigenous knowledge and and sort of the some of the objectives there that the declaration had um, to create more space for indigenous knowledge to be communicated mm -hmm. out. Perhaps um, I can't remember exactly how it was worded, but you know I think that's something that that researchers often are struggling with as to how to to access indigenous knowledge or to um, to see what's available or sort of understand how best to um, to work with it, if you will. So I don't know if you can speak to maybe how ICC is going to try to make um, indigenous knowledge sort of more um, more visible, perhaps, for researchers to engage with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so this is something we really actively already do, and and so we'll just kind of be continuing on with that. And 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 the objective is to uh, increase both political and intellectual space for indigenous knowledge holders. So IARPIC is a perfect example of that. Uh, um, through our relationship building with IARPIC and, and uh, colleagues like you, we've been sharing a lot about what indigenous knowledge is, how it could be used, um, and then some really key important principles uh, that come from indigenous knowledge, but also that we feel indigenous knowledge. And so that includes things like um, including indigenous knowledge holders in the analysis of information and and, and uh, when we talk about making that intellectual space we're talking about uh, you know even when you go sit at a table that at that table there is indigenous knowledge holders there and that the conversation is structured in a way that is conducive for both into indigenous knowledge holders and scientists or uh, as I, I said, even using platforms like um, like these webinars that we invite indigenous knowledge holders to be part of the discussion, to provide their own presentations, to set the agenda. So the same thing happens internationally where at, at the RIA Council in the UN, we try to educate what it means to be using indigenous knowledge to apply a holistic lens to uh, doing monitoring or making assessments or doing research. We try to educate on what it means to have a co-production of knowledge process. And so it's it's always um, needing to find what the challenges are and then addressing those challenges. So for example, right now we we see a key challenge is, is equity. And so we're re really working hard to, again, educate on what equity is while making and creating platforms that are built off of equity uh, so that that space can naturally be there. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thanks a lot. 
Um, are there any other questions about um, Carolina's presentation from anyone? <laughs> 